Good morning, everyone. Bonjour à tous, um, and welcome to another amazing uh, online edition of some Forward 50 content. Uh, this time coming to you, uh, thanks to our partners at the Institute on Governance. Um, we have some amazing things to discuss today and some fantastic speakers to discuss it. Uh, over the last six months or so, folks at the IOG have been working on a detailed study on the evolving role of the Chief Data Officer in the Government of Canada. The role of CDO is a vital one. And uh, we're going to get to a discussion in a few minutes about how it has changed and evolved over time. But I'd like to first begin by acknowledging that I'm joining you from the unceded Indigenous lands of the Kanyin Kiahaka Nation. As we are meeting in a virtual environment, we also acknowledge from coast to coast to coast the ancestral and unceded territory of all First Nations, Inuit, and Métis that call this land home. I invite you to take a moment to learn more about the Indigenous land on which you are joining us today or from which you're joining us today. I have a number of people joining us for this session, and I'm going to hand things over without further ado to our very capable co-hosts for today's discussion, um, Peter and Greg from the Institute on Governance, who will be joined, uh, sorry, Peter and Ryan from the Institute on Governance, who will be joined by uh, Gregory Richards from the University of Ottawa to talk more about this uh, amazing report and then welcome some of the people with the dirt under their proverbial fingernails to talk to us about uh, what their role is today and how it's changing. Hello, everybody. Morning, Alistair. Looking forward to this conversation. Um, how? Uh, what was the hardest thing about writing this uh, report? Uh, for, so from my end, I'll say first, I think there was just so many great insights that we captured over the course of six months. Um, you know, and I think we really wanted to boil this down to something that was going to be actionable for the chief data officer community. So we're we're hoping that we were able to, to hit that mark. And uh, we're going to we're looking forward to sharing with you some of our findings uh, this morning. How many departments did you talk to when you were compiling this? So we had, a, we had a total of four departments uh, that were the core members of the, the study that we were doing, uh, who are represented today on the panel. Uh, but then we had uh, a number of other chief data officers from about a dozen other departments across the government of Canada that we were engaged with throughout this. Um, and also had opportunities to engage with the chief data officer council through our process. So really, you know, we're able to get viewpoints from a lot of different stakeholders across the government of Canada. And Greg, what was the... Uh... The involvement of the University of Ottawa in all this? We were, um, so I've worked with uh, both Ryan and Peter for some time. We were doing a uh, parallel uh, study, so to speak, looking at the initial data strategies that were developed back in 2019, 2020, trying to get a sense of baseline of, of what was going on. So it's interesting to see the updated information relative to what we we're looking at at that time. And Peter, what would you say was the biggest surprise that you found when looking at this? Well, I'm, we're going to get into that uh, in, in more detail, but I think uh, the variety of definitions of what the CDO role is across uh, various departments is, uh, you know, different interpretations and different models that, uh, you know, seem to be adapted nicely to the context, but uh, more diversity than we expected. All right, I don't want to steal your thunder, so I'm going to uh, slink, slink into the background and let uh, the three of you welcome up your guests. Have a great conversation. I'll be here if you need me. Thank Perfect. you, Alistair. And uh, maybe I'll ask uh, if uh, if our, our facilitators can put the slides up on the screen. Peter, I'm going to turn the floor over to you first to, to, to set up the stage for the study. Perfect, thanks. So thank you, Alistair. Uh, and we're delighted to be with you today. Uh, I would also like to begin by acknowledging that the land from which our panel are participating is the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabeg people. So I'm Peter Bruce, a senior associate with the Institute of Governance, where I facilitate the executive leadership program. Before this, I enjoyed a wonderful career in the digital world of public service in the government of Canada and the government of Ontario. I'm going to kick off the panel with a brief description of the study and a few observations. Then I will turn it over to Ryan and Greg for a look at the data and how we have interpreted it. Ryan is the founder of Think Digital and collaborates with the IOG on the delivery of our excellent digital executive leadership program. Greg is the vice dean of Telfer School of Management at the University of Ottawa. From there, we will hear from four CDOs that were the primary participants in the study. 
as Alistair said, the people with the dirt under their fingernails. So we're going to hear from James Van Loon, the Chief Data Officer at Health Canada, Teresa D'Andrea, the Director General of Service and Data Modernization for Transport Canada, Elise Lejeune, the CDO at Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada, and Christopher Allison, CDO for the Public Health Agency of Canada. I'd like to thank them right up front for their leadership in the data community of the Government of Canada and the excellent collaboration that led to this study, this panel, and our report. Initial thinking about this project started about a year ago, and the work was conducted between September of 2021 and March of 2022. Over the course of the study, we explored the governance, role, and structure of the CDO function, looked into data sharing challenges and opportunities, we explored how to measure the performance of the chief data officer function, and looked into data management and analytics capacity and culture. The inputs for the study consisted of many interviews and workshops, as well as three surveys. The workshops, interviews, and surveys included CDO offices, internal stakeholders, and external stakeholders. While the number of survey respondents was small enough that it shouldn't be considered a representative sample, they do provide a good snapshot of the evolving role of the chief data officer and help to guide the issues that we explored further through the interviews and workshops. So before we get into uh, the data with Ryan and Greg, I'd just like to share four observations from the interviews and workshops, and they are supported by the data as well. But first off, senior level support for the chief data officer function is very strong. I'm going to just quote one of the deputies we interviewed. You want to be serving people and delivering on your mandate with the backbone of good evidence. But as strong as that support was at the top, uh, and the awareness was high at the top, I think because the data strategies have been approved there and, the, you know, positions have been created. There's still, a, I think we think because the position is relatively new, uh, the awareness of the CDO function across departments and particularly with external stakeholders was fairly low. Uh, everybody is facing <laughs> challenges with recruitment, retention and developing people uh, with the skill sets that uh, are needed. We did hear an observation that it, it's easier to retain data specialists when they're working on a file that they feel a real connection to, like, you know, transportation safety or, you know, pandemic response. You know, if, if they're specialized in that area, as well as having the data competencies, they tend to be, uh, you know, more engaged, more likely to stay. Funding came up as a recurring issue, and uh, we have recommendations that start to address, address that both as a challenge, but we feel an opportunity there. And the other opportunities that we highlight in the report are that uh, really important to continue focusing on developing data knowledge, skills, and culture. Big push for cross-jurisdictional data sharing, and I would say horizontal sharing across government. And finally, uh, really aligning the data, your uh, CDO activities to the needs of the departmental programs. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Ryan and Greg to walk you through uh, some of the data and its analysis. Great. Thanks, Peter. Um, so I'm going to start uh, with just sharing with everybody a, a few snapshots of some of the, the data that we collected over the course of the, the study to help get a little bit of context for the discussion we're going to get into with our, our CDO colleagues who are with us here on the panel today. Um, one of the questions we asked the CDOs that responded to our survey and that were involved in the study was around what types of common services they provide. Um, this is a, a bit of a snapshot of a categorization of that. And you can see that perhaps unsurprisingly, uh, topics like data science services, data management, and data policy and governance tended to, to top the list with, with most CDOs, you know, listing that as one of the areas they're involved with. A number of others, though, of course, popped up as part of that, including training, which is something we'll, we'll come to a little bit later on. 
Um, one of the interesting things we did through the survey that we had was we had produced a list of a dozen common types of priorities that CDOs might have. And we asked our three different respondent groups, uh, internal stakeholders, external stakeholders, and CDOs themselves to force rank those from, from one to 12 in terms of one being kind of highest priority for them, 12 being lowest. And it was interesting to look at the results as you see up on your screen right now. Uh, there certainly were a couple of areas of commonality, things like developing a departmental data strategy and developing policies for data usage across the organization were in the top four for all three audiences. Um, and vice versa, topics like open data and data quality assessment were actually at the bottom of the list for all three audiences as well. But you'll notice with, amongst the other topics that are there, there's actually quite a divergence of opinion. Uh, and that was something that I think we were quite interested in exploring further through the workshops and the interviews we did is to really understand how these different groups viewed the role of the CDO and, and what their relative priorities were. Um, we saw this even within the CDOs themselves. We had nine different chief data officer uh, teams respond to the survey. You know, and this radar graph gives you kind of a bit of a sense that the response in terms of their ranking of those 12 priorities tended to be, you know, quite, quite diverse. Um, we had a, a lot of a lot of commonality around departmental data strategies, advice and guidance uh, and developing policies, you know, with most people ranking those fairly high but a, a pretty wide range of opinion on the other ones. And in part, as Peter mentioned, linked to the fact that the mandates are somewhat different from different CDOs, uh, which influences where some of that focus tends to be. One of the other questions we asked was around what the major barriers are that, that CDOs are facing or that all stakeholders are facing around accessing and sharing data. Uh, and we actually took as a baseline questions that were asked in a 2019 survey by the Privy Council Office to results and delivery units across the government of Canada. We asked that same question, gave the same set of, of responses to our internal stakeholders, external stakeholder group, and, and chief data officer offices. Um, and so again, we find you know, some convergence and some divergence of responses on this. Um, you know, certainly we know for CDO offices, uh, they tend to be you know, particularly concerned about access to data, certainly externally, about um, you know, the quality and the format of the data that they're able to, to get access to. Whereas we see external stakeholders um, are particularly concerned about kind of both, you know, the lack of awareness of data, lack of information technology, lack of training, something that's that's mirrored as well by a lot of the internal stakeholders as well. So again, gives this kind of interesting perspective that amongst these different stakeholder groups, they all kind of view the challenges around this being somewhat different in terms of what the root causes are of it. We did ask about, you know, what people see as the biggest opportunities for these chief data officer roles um, and certainly the ability to kind of have a increased resources in terms of their capacity, the ability to kind of build, you know, integrated database management across the organization jumps up to, to kind of the top of that list. Um, but things like training, um, changing the culture within the organization and improving data sharing both inside and outside of the organization tended to jump out in the responses we saw on that question. Um, almost as kind of the inverse of that, when we ask about major barriers for the chief data officers, again, we hear about things around data culture, around the need for improving training and capacity in the organization, and just the resourcing levels uh, that the CDOs have to be able to achieve uh, their mandate. So from all of the work that, that we did on this study, uh, it led to us producing a series of 10 recommendations uh, that are in the study that was just released this morning. Uh, and I believe our, our colleagues from Forward 50 have, uh, have posted uh, the link to the study in the chat on LinkedIn. So for anybody who's interested in, in taking a read and diving deeper into it, you can find it there. Um, I'm just gonna very briefly kind of mention the recommendations we had uh, and certainly happy to kind of dive into this more when we get to the question and answer period. Uh, a little bit later on. So our, our, our recommendations were grouped into, into three buckets. And the first were what we kind of call the engage recommendations. Um, and so under this, um, we talked about the need to clarify and communicate the CDO role and vision and governance uh, in a stronger way, particularly because these are such new roles. Um, we found that they aren't typically kind of well-known, uh, both amongst internal and particularly amongst external stakeholders uh, that they work with. 
Um, being able to measure and demonstrate and capture the value of data and analytics, including you know, a focus on aggregating data to, to be able to get um, uh, measurable kind of insights out of uh, was something that we flagged as being really important to be able to kind of make that value case for, for the chief data officer role. Um, and then one of the issues that perhaps will not be surprising to a lot of people that came up time and time again was the need to improve data sharing between jurisdictions that really, you know, to unlock value for citizens that need to be able to share and use data from across jurisdictional boundaries, very high on people's radar. And particularly right now in the context of, you know, the public health crisis we've been going through for the last two years, this was something that in the health domain came up, but came up, frankly, across all the policy areas we were looking at. We then had a series of recommendations of what we call enable. And these are really about putting the building blocks in place to allow the chief data officers to be able to thrive and to be able to execute on their mandate. Um, this included things such as, you know, performing that core function of good data management, uh, being stewards of the data assets for the department was something that really kind of came up in the study as being uh, a need for chief data officers to be able to focus on. Um, certainly the issues around financing and funding models for CDOs, um, uh, both in terms of being able to provide infrastructure and tools for the department, but also the funding model for the CDO itself and for data-driven projects was something that came up time and time again, and, and we put some recommendations in place to help address that. Um, and then finally, the issue of skills and capacity building, you know, that need to ensure that both the organizations are able to recruit uh, the types of data skills into their organizations they need, but also to do upskilling of their existing workforce. Um, you know, with this recognition that data increasingly touches everybody's job uh, and is something that departments should be hopefully uh, being put more and more focus on in the future. And then finally, we had three recommendations in what we call our evolve category. And this is really kind of looking at that future evolution of where the chief data officer function goes. Um, and so, you know, the first was looking at that long term evolution of the chief data officer position. Right now, it's often quite tied to the chief digital officer or chief information officer. And so one of our recommendations is really kind of looking at what does that long term evolution look like and, and what does that relationship between the chief data and chief digital officer evolve to? Secondly, um, was a recommendation around embedding data teams into program and business lines. Uh, some of our partners who are on the call today um, are already doing this. And, and as Peter had mentioned earlier, there's some real benefits of this, not just in terms of improving outcomes, but also from a recruitment and retention standpoint for data experts. Um, and then finally, um, issues around information management, open data and transparency initiatives came up a number of times in the study. Um, and often the relationship the chief data officer has to these important roles um, can be somewhat fuzzy. And so one of the recommendations was to really kind of clarify and, you know, I think in our view, see the chief data officer take a bit of a stronger role on, on championing information management and open data as part of their mandate as well, potentially. So that's in a, in a very quick nutshell, um, some of the findings we had, the recommendations that we have in the study. Uh, and I'm going to turn the floor over to Greg uh, to share a little bit of, of the work that Greg was doing, looking at uh, data strategies from Government of Canada departments and some of his perspective from, uh, from the University of Ottawa. So Greg, over to you. Great. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Ryan and Peter. Uh, bonjour tout le monde. It's a pleasure to be here. So in my role at the university, I, as Peter mentioned, I'm Vice Dean of the Grad Professional Programs, but my research is focused on how organizations use analytics to drive results. Uh, and so we uh, had a look at uh, the data strategies that were published, not all of them, some of them that were published in 2019. Uh, on the left side of the screen uh, are the commonalities. Uh, so in the box in the middle, data infrastructure, use of advanced uh, analytics to drive better service and, and results for Canadians. So that's very standard in all of the documents. Uh, the bubbles on the left side, uh, most of them talked about a culture shift. Many of them talked about data as a corporate asset uh, and then capacity building. So you see common themes uh, from uh, 2019 to what uh, Peter and Ryan just presented. The two bubbles on the lower right are uh, some of the outliers. So some of the documents talked about performance indicators for data analytics. Makes a lot of sense. If we're going to invest uh, in data to uh, influence the outcomes that we care about, we should probably sort of track whether or not it's actually having the impact that we want it to have. 
Uh, and then ecosystem development, which is interesting because, uh, you know, Teresa was talking earlier about the priorities. If you go the priority slide, that development of the ecosystem was seen fairly low for the CDO office and the internal stakeholders, very high for external stakeholders. Uh, and so that's an interesting point that uh, stood out as an outlier. What I'd like to do in the next two slides is drill down a little bit on the ecosystem piece by presenting a case study, one of the first uh, case studies we did on this area of how to use data in government organizations. I think you'll be uh, interested in some of the insights. Uh, so from the data strategies, most government organizations collaborate on their data strategies, the various committees and so on. So you, you do talk uh, with each other quite often. Uh, ecosystem development uh, was discussed by a few, uh, and, and so the question is, when we talk about ecosystem, what do we mean? Other government departments, obviously, but also there are academics and, and think tanks that are out there that work in this space. And so the question is, you know, how do we actually collaborate in an ecosystem environment? So the case study is a uh, provincial department, 4,200 uh, employees, uh, regionalized, uh, across uh, Ontario and heavily unionized. Uh, that becomes an important point, which I'll explain in a minute as, as we go to the next slide. Obviously, I can't say too much about the organization because we did promise confidentiality, but you'll see uh, why the unionized element is so important. So leveraging the ecosystem, um, a couple of important things. So uh, on the left side, so they did not start with a data strategy. They didn't write one. What they did was they asked the question, can better use of data help us meet our results expectations? So what they actually wrote was a business plan in which data played prominently in how they were gonna reach the objectives. Now, it seems like a simple question. Can analytics help us better meet uh, our results expectations? Um, the answer to that question was debated to the senior management team for some time and what they were trying to get to was, when I use data better in my organization, what actually happens? Some of the research that we've done suggests that it shows up in two places. One is at the process level, where better data helps us streamline processes and stop doing things that are not driving us to the results we care about. And secondly, at the decision-making level, that in a lot of situations, we're trying to use data to make better decisions. Usually that's more managerial. Uh, and so they drill down with program managers, people who are actually managing programs to deliver results to Canadian and asking that question. And they went across a number of different departmental areas to try to get a sense of if I gave you better or better analyzed data, how would you use it? And what would you actually do with it? And how would I know that we're actually having a result? It's a really interesting uh, conversation. It didn't start with the data at all. It started with the results that they wanted to accomplish and backed up to, can I use data in a better way? So the ecosystem, how, how did they involve the ecosystem? Uh, the ecosystem for them consisted of a number of uh, think tanks out there who uh, were interested in how to use data and some of the, uh, some of the university researchers. Uh, the first point was helping them with the middle question that I just talked about. Right, how to get uh, there's a there's a framework out there called GDI uh, goals, decision, and information, and so uh, working with some of the uh, academics, they were able to figure out um, what are some of the business objectives that they ha they had, what data were available to them, and what types of decisions they would actually make using those 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 data points, uh, and so they did a data inventory, try to figure out. What data do we have? But it was done in the context of what decisions do we have to make in order to influence the business results we care about. What that allowed them to do was not try to boil the ocean. They focused on very specific types of decisions that could be informed with the data that they knew would have an impact on the results that, uh, that they cared about. The role of the, the academics and, and, and the other folks they engaged was to help build a recognition of what the organization was trying to do with data. So remember the unionization piece? Uh, there was a lot of suspicion, right? Anytime you start to do something a little different in organizations using data in different ways, there's suspicion that, you know, something's going on behind the scenes and so on and so forth. So they're very careful about having external validation of the assessment of how to use the data. When they actually started to crunch the numbers, 
they had external validation just to show it was almost like a peer review process to show the process it was done properly there was no hidden agendas and things like that uh, and before they actually made any changes related to the analysis that was done with the data they used they had a second validation process and they distributed that widely across all the stakeholders once everything was understood then they started to make changes so it, it wasn't a process of asking the question um, you know what do we do with all this data we have is a process of saying how do we get better results and can data help and the idea was let's not boil the ocean let's focus on the very specific pain points the ecosystem was important to provide validation across their internal stakeholders both the regions as well as the uh, as well as the union members to get a sense that there are no hidden agendas everything was transparent and we look for good validation before we move forward so that's that's really what this notion of the ecosystem uh, can do. And if you're moving forward to think about the enablement or the evolution of uh, how to use data in organizations, I think it's a nice case study that uh, tried not to be everything to everyone, but focus on very specific wins that they could get by using data. So that's uh, really what I wanted to share with you, uh, Ryan. So uh, over to you. Great. No, thanks so much, Greg. And I, and I think, you know, this issue around that ecosystem approach is so important because, you know, I, I do think one of those key recommendations from, from the study that Peter and I were doing was around how do we break down those jurisdictional boundaries, right? We, we, this, this notion of kind of unlocking data that exists sometimes, you know, across uh, this broader ecosystem came up time and time again. So thanks, Greg, for, for, I think, getting us to kind of think about that and that notion of being results focused around how we use data. Um, so without further ado, uh, I want to open up the panel um, to our, our four um, folks who are kind of on the ground floor dealing with these data issues in Government of Canada departments um, day by day. And we're going to have a chance to, to bring them into the conversation now. And I think really, you know, they, they've got some fascinating insights from how they've been approaching, you know, this relatively new role of a chief data officer in a Government of Canada department um, and what some of the, the challenges, successes and issues that are on their mind as, as this role continues to evolve. Um, so I'm going to first bring in uh, James Van Loon into the conversation. Uh, James is the Chief Data Officer at Health Canada. And uh, James, I turn the floor over to you. I'm uh, curious to hear about what uh, the great work that you were doing at Health Canada in this domain. Thanks. Um, I think maybe as an opening part, there's lots of room for discussion. So as an opening part, I'll just have a couple of things to say. Premièrement, je voudrais juste mentionner que bien que notre discussion aujourd'hui, nos présentations sont en anglais, ce car uh, Ford 50 est un forum international. Uh, on vous invite à participer dans, la, participer dans la langue de votre choix, certainement. Uh, secondly, um, um, like it's just a terrifically exciting time to be involved in this, uh, in this area. And um, that's because of all of us coming to these realizations about just how powerful uh, solid data-based approaches can be in informing decisions um, for the government, for people around the world. Uh, we learned a little bit about that from the private sector first, and now we're only just really starting to get our hands wrapped around how this matters, as you pointed out in the report, uh, for the public good. Uh, and I'm really excited to be part of that. You mentioned the, the diversity of approaches that you see from all of the chief data officers across the government, and that doesn't surprise me at all. There's a diversity of approaches, there's a diversity of tools, but there's a single mandate, get better decisions, get better data, to get better information, to get better decisions, and better serve Canadians. And I'm really excited to be part of that. And I'm, I'm glad there's this diversity. It's so new, and we're all going to learn from each other, it really emphasizes the the need to maintain this kind of community that we are building through this kind of presentation, thank Forward 50, uh, through IOG report, and through our own sort of internal networks and external networks. The other thing I'll mention here is it very clearly to me is not just a technical game, uh, good use of data. Um, it is a technical game. There's, you know, advanced analytics to be dealt with. There's all data lakes and cloud environments and all the different kinds of open source and uh, and commercial tools that you can use. But there's getting access to the data, there's integrating the data, there's building trust among data partners, there's a lot of sort of people skills involved in the data game. And um, 
I really, I just think this is an opportunity to exercise all of the skills of a really good government team. Um, so um, that's probably enough for starters. We have lots of work to do to build capacities around Health Canada, around the government of Canada, around everywhere, just basic capacities for data management and to leverage the places where we already have those and are ready to charge forward and advance um, much more advanced uh, data analytics. Uh, but it's just, it's a fun time to be here. Oh, that's great. Thank, thanks, James. I think there's some really helpful kind of framing thoughts um, around all of this. Uh, I'm going to go to Teresa next, and, and uh, Teresa is joining us from Transport Canada. And Teresa, I want to bring you into the conversation next and share some of your perspective. And Teresa, I think your, your audio may just be muted if you want to unmute. Yeah, apologies. I muted myself because the landscaping guys were outside of my neighbors, so I just didn't want all the ambient noise. So I just wanted to say thank you so much. Um, I think the, the conversation, Greg, I was taking notes diligently. Um, I love the work that you were doing. I think that's amazing. And I think one of the things that, you know, I've been in this industry for, you know, 20 plus years. Um, a little, maybe a little bit more, um, but you know, I'm always learning. And I think that's something that's really important. This is such a, such a new, um, a new approach to leveraging data. And I, uh, you know how sometimes at night you, you know, you're, you're on YouTube and you kind of go down a bit of a rabbit hole. So lately I was, um, I found, uh, Yuval Noah Harari, who's a professor, um, in the department of history at the Hebrew university in Jerusalem. And he's talking about how, you know, our, we use our five senses, to pull in data, right? So you have a monkey who's trying to, you know, get to bananas and he sees a lion. And so, you know, all the processing that has to happen, you know, it's it's data that you're pulling in, you know, how, how hungry am I? How far is the lion? Does the lion look sleepy? Does the lion look hungry, right? Can I run fast? Can I outrun the lion? And at the end of the day, you take in all these data points through your five senses, and then your brain through chemistry, right? provides a response. So your response is fear or your response is courage, but it's pulling in that data and making a decision based on that data. And essentially that's what we're doing, right? When it look, when we look at the data that we're, we're, we're playing with right now. Um, so I'm with Transport Canada. I've only been here um, a year, but we are an incredibly uh, data rich environment. Right? We have internal operations data, transactional data from industry. We've got big data, structured, unstructured. Um, and then we layer this with all the data that's coming in various formats like email, Excel, which are sadly the most popular here. Right, And we're looking at you know, that, that being able to process that and make sense of that. So we've typically always had people who do, you know, do a lot of analytics work and you know, are, are looking at spreadsheets and trying to make sense of, of them. And how do we then, you know, change that so that we can really leverage technology to get those insights, you know, the analytics that Greg was talking about to get those insights right away. So, I mean, that's something that I, I, I think is a really exciting time. Um, I think we're past the I don't know what I don't know phase. I think we're now in the I know what I don't know. And it's how do we evolve from there and how like how do we push to that next level to really become sort of, you know, to have that data be ubiquitous and to leverage all of the data that we have um, access to. So I think for me, that's that's the really exciting part of this study. And um, yeah, I'm going to pass it over to the next person I, that was on our list. Perfect. No, thanks, yeah. Teresa. Okay, that's thanks. Great to get uh, get your perspective on that. And uh, I'm going to call on Elise to, to join us next. Uh, Elise is uh, in the Chief Data Officer role for Agriculture and Agri-for Canada. So Elise, would love to hear your perspective on this as we kind of set up the conversation. Absolutely. Merci beaucoup. Et uh, bonjour à tous. Ça me fait plaisir de me joindre à l'équipe aujourd'hui comme uh, James uh, on fait le, la présentation et la plupart des, des points en anglais, mais ça me fera plaisir de répondre en français ou en anglais. And also, yes, thank you. It was, uh, it was a pleasure to participate in the study. I've uh, been the Chief Data Officer for not quite a year at AAFC. It's a new role, a new office. And I think the first action I did was to say, yes, we're jumping into that study. I want to hear more about this and where things are going. I'm still as excited uh, almost a year later to, to be in that place that is um, as James and Teresa were saying, so dynamic and exciting. It can be dizzying at times because there are so, so, so many things that, that we 
want to do and have to do. I, I often, uh, when I talk about the role of chief data officer, I often refer to it as being uh, uh, the cheerleader and the quarterback and the referee when it comes to data. And, and it, it's funny because it, it lines up really well with the engage, evolve, and um, I'm losing the third one. Uh, engage, evolve, and um, uh, enable, exactly. enable, sorry, yes. enable. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Ryan. So I think these things are true and, and it's finding that balance between the work that we need to do to get our houses in order because it's crucial that we do that to be able to really truly unlock the power of data and make the most of that ecosystem that uh, Gregory was referring to and really start to reap all those uh, benefits and the promise that comes with a good use and an, uh, uh, a good use of data a good um, question asking, what is it that we're trying to do? Because oftentimes I find we, 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 we get bogged down by the getting perfect in the way of good enough and we don't try things and we don't try to evolve. And I think that's gonna be the key for us is that breaking those processes and making sure that we find the best way to collaborate together not just for the, the the benefits of Canadians, for sure, but I think that even as a public service, this is a challenge we need to accept because we have limited resources. And this is clearly a way for us to make more with less by working together more efficiently and by connecting with our ecosystem. Um, and and because they're faced with the same challenges. Agriculture is, is one of the few shared jurisdictions. So we do have to work with our provincial partners very closely. We love to do so. And I think there is immense possibility to advance the work and, and be able to support that decision making, allocate our resource more efficiently and lean our processes so that we're able to uh, provide that uh, service to Canadian. I also think that James, you touched on the trust aspect of things, right? We often silo data into the IT and the tech side of the things. One of the thing at AAFC that we've done is we've put the chief data office with both um, more of that people skills and that EC side of things and IT together. And I think it's, it's, it has its challenges when, when you bring those kinds of people that don't quite talk the same language together, but it does afford, as we learn to work together better, it does afford you to try different things and to move uh, problematics along. So I, I think the last point I'll make is, is I think we need to not underestimate the culture shift that it requires. And, and, and that's the cheerleader role, I think, most part of my, of my jobs is that, you know, it's easy to, to, to uh, sell a snazzy dashboard that, that provides some interesting insight and simplify things. Everybody's happy to see the dashboard. But if we're not able to change the culture and if, if we don't take the time to invest in the people and into the structure so that we're able to learn from these things and be more effective, I think we're, we're, we have a, a steep curve ahead. So anyway, those are, those are my points for now. I'm really looking forward to the discussion and to the interaction. Thanks so much, Elise. Yeah, and I think again, you know, great set of considerations um, as we kind of go into exploring this topic a bit more in the broader discussion. Um, I'm going to kind of bring to the virtual stage our, the last of our, our four chief data officer colleagues, uh, Chris Allison from the Public Health Agency of Canada. Um, I just wanted to mention for everybody who's listening in live with us, um, once uh, Chris has given us kind of his opening thoughts, we are going to open it up for kind of a broader discussion and Q&A. So if people do have questions for our panel of chief data officers or about the study that, that we've been doing at the IOG, um, please feel free to use the chat function on LinkedIn Live uh, to post some of those questions and we'll be going to those shortly. Um, but Chris, I want to turn the floor over to you. And I, and I think, you know, um, last but certainly not least of our group, in public health data Data, probably for most Canadians has been very top of mind for these last two years. And I think you're in this fascinating position at the public health agency in thinking about those data needs. So, you know, quite curious to kind of hear your thoughts on this and how you've been approaching this role as chief data officer for, for the public health agency of Canada. Thanks so much, Ryan. And hello, folks. Uh, really great to be with you here today. And Ravi uh, d'être ici avec mes collègues et et uh, de, 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 tout le monde dans, dans cet écosystème ici uh, qui, qui travaille dans le monde de données ou au, gov, au gouvernement. Uh, so first, I, I'd really like to thank uh, our colleagues at Ford 50 and IOG. And I'm, I want to say that the study itself, like the final report is great, but the process was really useful as we were figuring ourselves out. And I've been the chief data officer at the Public Health Agency of Canada for a little bit under a year now. So 
also fairly new in the space and coming in in the middle of a global pandemic that looks like it's getting better and then suddenly is getting much worse and then might be getting better, but we don't really know, it is a very, very interesting place to be. And so the guides and the kind of the fingers pointing in different directions uh, have been extraordinarily useful. Data obviously is absolutely key to our, to our business. It's a key to understanding ourselves as an organization, the impact of what we're doing, uh, how effective we are, where we have gaps, but also to understanding our world and the people we're here to serve and making decisions that have the highest likelihood of creating public good and understanding the impact of those decisions and, and understanding that today, not in an audit that takes place five years from now. So it's the cycles, it's the feedback loops that's really important. But probably the most important thing I mentioned just above is, is actually public good. The work that we're doing in public health and, and in the work of uh, my colleagues here today is, is not about improving click-through rates. It's not about more advertising or more effective advertising. It's really about helping people and providing the support necessary for a democratic, diverse, and inclusive society. Uh, and doing that while acknowledging that we have a long, long way to go. And we have bias and we have uh, systemic issues throughout our organizations and throughout our society that we need to work together uh, with ourselves in government, but also with different levels of society, uh, from citizens to NGOs to interest groups uh, to make sure that we can actually do that. So doing this, and especially doing data with the public good lens, means that it's got to be a couple of things. First, it's got to be ethical and inclusive, right? There is bias in all of our data. And there's colonialism implicit in how we collect it, the questions we ask, who gets to define who can answer these questions and how we do that. So we need to acknowledge that and we need to really commit to doing better as we're doing this work. It's gotta be integrated. Uh, and, and which means like we, we've gotta break down the silos and there, there are absolutely privacy uh, issues at play and personal and human rights at play. And we need to find a way to to hold on to that tension, to completely and fully respect the privacy rights that folks have, while at the same time recognizing the social good that can be obtained from the identified aggregated data that does not kind of take anything away from any person, but can potentially give society so much. And one of the framings for this in public health is the idea of one health. And that's that public health is not just what's happening. It's not just about the virus. It's about the environment. It's about the movement of agriculture, it's agri-food, it's animals, it's wildlife, and how all of this comes together. And all of that is influenced by the human political layer. So we're looking at a really complex system and being able to figure out how to use data effectively in that space is really, really tricky, but that's exactly what we need to do if we're going to generate the insights, really understand things, and take decisions that are going to have impact. And I guess that's the other thing. I, I love the, the statement about it's not about a dashboard. It's absolutely not. Who needs to use the dashboard? What decisions do you want to see coming out of that? How are you going to know if those decisions are useful? Are they changing things in the way that you want? And then how are you going to build that into a feedback loop that helps you to do better there? So there's a lot of buzzwords and a lot of people in the space um, trying to, to both kind of promote things and sell things. But, but there's a couple of things that I think are, are really important to using data right. First is, do using data effectively in government means culture change, right? It means doing government as unusual, as kind of a slight nod to Honey Dakine. So it, it's not just digitizing a platform. It's not just, oh, we have this data and we're going to do the same thing. Understanding the flow of data, understanding what we can do, means we probably need to be doing different things or the very minimum, we need to do the work or achieve the objectives that we have potentially in very different ways. So in fact, basically we're working with the missions to promote and protect the health of Canadians. Our role and my focus really has been on operationalizing our data strategy. It's very good, it's in place. So our focus is how do we actually build data skills and the IT skills directly into our organization at the point of business. So you've got that mix where we've got the science uh, where we've got the epidemiological and the public health expertise, the social science expertise, and the data expertise sitting together and curating that data, stewarding the data to make sure that it can do the most good possible. And often that means getting it outside the walls of the public health agency to provinces, territories, researchers, academics, frontline healthcare providers. So that's the journey we're on. 
and just really thrilled to be doing it with uh, such amazing colleagues. So I'll close off here and really looking forward to the discussions. That's great. Thanks so much, Chris. And thanks to everybody. I mean, this was, uh, I think, such a rich process uh, having, you know, the the four departments that were involved and kind of the broader chief data officer ecosystem and the government of Canada involved in this. And, and Peter, I know, you know, when we when we set up the study, one of the things you and I talked about a number of times was the fact that, you know, kind of to what Chris said, the process itself is part of the real benefit of this, right, is, is to be able to pull these, these, these departments together, these chief data officers together, get them kind of to share, you know, their views on how their roles are evolving. And I maybe wanted to kind of throw that as a first question out to our panelists. Um, is you know this question of what did you learn through the process of the study? Um, you know we the the four CDOs that you all see um, on your screens this morning. You know we got together on a monthly basis. We were obviously doing kind of in depth workshops and interviews in each of the four departments. So I'd love to kind of just open the floor to maybe kind of kick off the conversation to get a sense of you know over the the six or seven month journey we had doing this study. Uh, what really stood out for you is something that you learned from your colleagues in other departments that that perhaps you know may not have been on your radar when. when when we started the process. For whoever wants to venture first to jump into this, so open the floor. Well, I'd made start it off by just saying, um, while I worked very closely with a lot of data through the pandemic, I only really became a, a chief data officer like in January or February. Um, and uh, one of the, so I kind of joined into this study mid midstream um but at the same time that may mean that i benefited more than anyone and then one of the biggest things that i learned was that many of the questions that I were jigging around in my head about like is this what it's like everywhere and the diversity of skills that i see around the department and the and the importance of like this massive cultural shift that has to happen although it's already got leaders in various places like do i just miss the point here and i was um very happy to note uh and to learn from you all that we're kind of all in this together we're all facing this the same set of challenges of building capacity in situ because of questions that we don't even know yet but we know the data is going to be key to answer them and what are we going to do to do those things um and i and then that togetherness continues as i said in terms of saying like all right here's a bunch of strategies that we're trying and here's another bunch of strategies that one of the other us is trying and we're going to use our community to kind of assess how those are going so that that was a big one for me no that's great james uh, and that's actually great great to hear that it gave you a little bit of uh, peace of mind on on that piece of it um chris maybe i'll go to you next to jump in on this question super thanks ryan um i i think we used the study as a way to validate a lot of thinking that we had hypotheses we had as we were kind of figuring out like how do we operationalize the data strategy and how do we do it in a way that it doesn't have people throwing fruit at us. Um, so one of the big things that came out of it is just how hard it is to do data in silos across government. And, and like there's the sharing and how do you get it in different places, but even just doing the data work. In other words, if you want to do um, if you want to purchase data, if you want to establish a partnership or an MOU, there's so many hoops that folks like in the program and surveillance lines needed to go through, and they wanted help with this. They're looking for, you know, templates. They're looking for processes. They're looking for guide, like guidance and people to actually help them move through all of the hurdles that we we tend to put in the way of doing work in government, because we, we do tend to be very risk averse. And when you're dealing with personal public health information like this, it's a very important piece. But just kind of seeing how much need was there was uh, was a bit of a surprise. And we actually had to update our plan based off some of that feedback. Well, that's great. Thanks, Chris. Um, Teresa, can I go to you next just to get your thoughts on on kind of what you learned throughout the course of the, the study process? Yeah, absolutely. So I think, you know, I, I'll just echo what James said that, you know, we're all very similar and we're all headed in the same direction, even though some of, you know, we're going about it maybe a little bit differently, but we're really going in the same direction. And I think what Elise said, it's all about the people is so relevant. Um, you know, at the end of the day, if our people aren't bought into it at, the, at every level, um, you're not going to be successful. Um, and we're really witnessing dedicated data like data competent staff spending a lot of time accessing, correcting, collecting data. 
And then it really detracts from the time that you have to do the higher value analysis, which really, you know, people really shine when they get to use their brains, where they're looking at judgment and, um, you know, uh, creativity and exploration. Yet most of our people spend most of their time, like, you know, especially the data literate one, are spending a lot of time on repetitive tasks, accessing, collection, collation, you know, and that's where the tech tech really shines, right? Um, is that sensing, predicting, optimizing, and we're not really fully harnessing. So I think that's something, you know, from a culture perspective, we have a department, and I think all of our departments have leadership that's really hungry for change and innovation, and I think that goes across the board. So I'm really impressed with the appetite and that desire to utilize our analytics, but, you know, so that we can free up our people to actually do some of the cool, exciting, you know, creative work that they, that they really want to be doing. Cause I, I, you know, most people don't come into the office saying, I wish I could pour over, you know, endless data sets to try to find the patterns, you know, let's, let's let the tech do that. Yeah, well, that's great, Teresa. I appreciate the insights on that. Um, and and Elise, maybe I'll go to you uh, last, just on this on this question around you know what you learned through the process of the study. Absolutely, I think that um, we have a saying in French: "Quand on se regarde, on se désole; quand on se compare, on se console." And I think that that really uh, spoke to it, which essentially it's it means like when you look at yourself, you're a little bit distraught, but when you compare with each other, you kind of feel better about it. So I think that was really what came out to this. And as I was um, starting my journey as the CDO with AFC, having those colleagues to be able in a safe space to riff off. And I think Teresa said it like realizing we're all going in the same direction. We all have the same similar question. How we go about answering them is going to change. Um, and, and I just want to add a little bit on you know, the promise of data or what I call the promise of data is really the investment that you need to do upfront, that preventive investment that you do upfront so that you're able to share and to use and to really get the most out of that data. I'm from a very data rich department too. We have uh, science, we're a science based department. We create a lot of data. How can we make sure that we get everything that we can out of that data, whether it's us or whether it's with our partners? So I, I think that it just it just energized me a lot and, and it, it made me feel very proud to be a public servant as well and see that there's such a community of engaged people at all level that really want to use data for the public good, as Chris was so aptly saying earlier. So I'll leave it at that for now. No, ab absolutely, Lisa. And I, and, and I share that view. I, I think I think I can speak for Peter as well and probably Greg also is, you know, just the fact that there is a lot of enthusiasm around this, um, you know, has been really, really powerful. Um, there's there's a lot of questions coming in on uh, on the chat from LinkedIn, which is fantastic. And there's a there's a handful of them in particular I want to kind of go to next that are really around the relationship between the chief data officer and some of the other kind of C-suite responsibilities within uh, Government of Canada departments. Um, I, Keen, I think, was had first kind of raised this issue around, you know, what does that defined relationship look like between the CDO and CIO? Um, Trevor had added in kind of the, the link around open data and information management and what that links looks like. And I noticed that Barbara had also asked a question around how did the CFO work with the CDO? So this whole issue around the relationship between these positions loomed large in our study. And I think, to be frank, was probably one of the impetuses behind it. Um, and I would love to kind of get um, our CDO colleagues' views on this. And maybe, Greg, I'll also come to you for, for your perspective, having looked at this from, from kind of uh, the University of Ottawa. But Teresa, maybe I'll go to you first on this question, because I think transport has a particularly interesting kind of governance model at one end of the spectrum, where it's actually very combined, right, where the chief data officer and the chief digital officer are the same person. Um, and so maybe we'd love to kind of get your thoughts on kind of how you've addressed the kind of data digital relationship. And then we'll, we'll go to the rest of the panel for their thoughts on it. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, oh, there are C suite all merged into one, <laughs> except for our CFO. Um, so yeah, so we've we uh, several years ago decided to pull all those um, those roles together. So our CIO, our CTO, our CDO, CDO from a data perspective, and CDO from a C chief digital uh, officer perspective. So we've rolled all those into one person who is our ADM, who is Raj Thupal. Um, and we really are hoping that this approach will highlight the importance of that cohesion where resources and energy and time are directed at the same North Star. 
So that's ultimately our vision on how data, technology, and people interplay within our organization. Um, and we're really like so far so good. Like I, I've been really impressed um, with the way that we're working very closely with our policy team, with our safety and security team, and with our programs area. And Raj at the ADM level has been able to um, put pull together a really good relationship with our chief financial officer, right? So, and I don't want to get into costing just in case there are questions on that later, but, you know, really being able to, um, to have that horizontal view. So whether it comes from applications that we have in place or, um, you know, pr providing data strategy, services, um, whatnot, we really provide that horizontal across the, the department. And it's been working really well. We, we're very tight with our, um, with our other shops. And so time will tell, but so far so good. And we have, you know, um, through governance, we really try to uh, pull that together and to make data and service. Again, I'm, I'm responsible for data and service modernization, which I think is really important that we've merged those two as well because you can't really have a service without data, right? And data just for the sake of data without providing a service is kind of, is, is pointless, right? So to have those two merge together and then providing that horizontal across um, the department has been uh, very key for us. So, so far so good. Well, thanks, Teresa. Um, James, maybe I'll go over to you next just to, to talk about how you've been approaching this relationship between data, digital, and kind of the broader level, you know, C-suite community at Health Canada. Sure. Thank you. Uh, uh, first of all, I'll just say, like at Health Canada, we we debated vigorously whether the CDO would land in the strategic policy branch or in the digital transformation branch. And ultimately, we ended up in the digital transformation branch. But there's no getting around um, uh, deep relationships with all of the branches, and especially the strategic policy branch. And ultimately, today, you're not doing strategic policy if you're not doing data analysis to support it. Um, and, um, so that's kind of the, there was, we were ambivalent, uh, on the other hand, I'm very happy to have landed in the, uh, digital transformation branch, frankly, to put it almost crassly, I can't really imagine trying to do the CDO job if my objectives were not linked to the CIO's job in somebody else's performance agreement. Um, it's very important that that perform, that that partnership be, um, effective. We need the environments and the tools we can recruit all the analysts we want but if we can't equip them with the stuff they want they're gone like that um so um, that's that and then on the cfo relationship there's really two key aspects to that one is about getting those tools and and the governance of investment planning for um for it and for data management tools uh, across the department there's lots of room to make gains there um I think we're not the only department that has struggled at times with a large number of individual investment projects on, on tools, when really we need to get to a, a stronger enterprise architecture and a much more responsive stance using stuff that we already have to address data issues that are live today. And as a program DG, I am scarred with tools that I didn't have because of tools that I didn't have when I needed them. Uh, so there's that aspect of the CFO side. The other side is the, there's so much more to do in linking financial performance data with uh, outcome data for Canadians. It's just there's miles and miles to go uh, and many, many projects that we could implement there. Uh, the challenge there is like, how does that pile on to the other thousand data projects that we could be doing in Health Canada? And that goes back to the importance of like, yeah, we're not trying to boil the ocean, but we do need to be building capacity across because we can't do everything from the CDOs. We can't do close to everything from the CDOs. We need to build the capacity across the department. That's great. Um, Elise, maybe I'll go to you next on this question, because, again, I think, you know, it's, it's interesting to kind of see how different departments have approached this. And you've got kind of this unique joint reporting relationship for your your CDO function. So, Elise, maybe you could share a bit about how you've been structuring this at Agriculture. Absolutely. So at Agriculture, the decision was made to um, have the CDO report directly to the CIO in the Information Service Tech branch, I think, to, to speak to that relationship between data, tech, and everything else. The work that was done previously was done in the strategic policy branch, speaking to the analyst side of, of the work. And I do have also a reporting uh, relationship to the ADM of strategic policy. So in, in my case, I'm at the DG level and I report to uh, two ADMs essentially in the tech side and the policy side. I think it's a very interesting model because it really speaks to the soft side of the data and then the hard side of the data and having them together, I mentioned that earlier, 
those are those are speaking total different languages right and they are the, it, just the the making sure that they understand each other and that they understand their challenges and and letting go of some of that i would say historical uh view uh of it i think at, and i know it's true at afc i don't know if it's like that elsewhere IT was often seen as a service provider, providing computer, making sure the video conference was working and so on and so forth, right? And in the past few years, there's really been a change to a more strategic uh, role for the IT branch to help answer those questions, to participate at the table early on. And I think that in that context, having this kind of relationship within with the CDO in that neurologic spot is a very interesting model. It does bring its challenges, but I think I think we're all, there's no, I think one of you were asking about the takeaways earlier, there's not one size fits all approach to how you do it, right? You have to adapt to your circumstance, to your stakeholders, to your organization and its, its history. And I think it's the right place to be for us right now. It'll be interesting to see how things evolve, it, where it's gonna move to, right? Um, and we'll, we'll see where that goes. In terms of the, the relationship with the, the CFO, so for, I think that it, it's broader than just the CDO. I think in general, we need to think about how we want to fund transformation and innovation in government while still maintaining what we need to do in terms of delivering service that we're committed to in our mandate. So I think I think the relationship is a very important one, but I also think that it's a place where the dialogue needs to change. And again, I think it's not just at, at AFC, I think it's throughout government, right? How do we make sure that we have what we need to deliver to our stakeholder, but at the same time, looking ahead, how do we fund this going forward? So, but I think those are all conversation, very healthy conversation to have together. They're happening throughout the departments and with central agencies as well. So I guess it's a, an evolving conversation there too. Thanks, Elise. Um, Chris, maybe I'll, I'll go to you if you want to just share a little bit about how public health agencies kind of structured that relationship between the CDO and, and the digital parts of the organization. Yeah, for sure. So as um, as James alluded to, we have a new chief digital officer in Health Canada who is responsible for providing services both to the Public Health Agency of Canada and Health Canada. And before that, the CIO also sat and or still does sit in Health Canada and still and has that dual service provision mandate. So I think this it's an excellent question. I think there's different ways. I don't think there's a one size fits all approach that needs to be in place, but I think they absolutely need to be joined at the hip. Uh, and you can't have you can't have them pulling different directions. I think one of the uh, I would I don't think any of my colleagues would uh, would challenge me if I say like we have a capacity issue in, in terms of of our technology uh, users and data users across the government of Canada. We don't have enough to do all the work that we want to do, and especially in the CIO area, you're pulled in so many different directions. So. You know, how do you choose whether this, you know, data priority is going to go forward or this, you know, Wi-Fi priority or getting these devices to people? It's a really tricky space. So I think making sure that you've got the ability to to prioritize data and to do that hand in hand with with the CIO uh, structure is super important. Um, little little kind of dialogue, but. Before I came into the job, I spent about a week uh, doing research on why CDOs fail. And there, there's a plethora of articles out there. So you can you know, check them out and, and see. And one of the risks is actually separating the, the engineering from the data science. And this is something just because of our classification, I think we do in government. It's like, okay, you're an EC, you're an IT, data, okay, EC. Without understanding that if you're going to do modern data analysis, that means there's going to be a database somewhere. Right, which means you need to think about access protocols and you need a server. And if you need a server, you need networks. And if you need networks, you need security. So you end up needing an entire data stack. And when the priorities and the capacities are separated, it's really, really hard to get things done in a way that will, will actually do the meaningful work that organizations need. So I think th those bits coming together are, are incredibly important. On the CFO, I'd say the most conversation, the most common conversation I have with our CFO is one of value. It's like, okay, this is great, Chris. Like, love your strategy. It's all good. You're doing great stuff. Like, show me the money. Like, what are what value are we getting for this work that you're doing? Uh, and being able to to tell that story and show that is incredibly important. So we've got great support, but uh, 
but they, you got to show what you're doing. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Chris. And, and I'm glad you brought up that point about kind of the data engineering versus the data science, because this came up a number of times through the course of, of our work on the study, is the need to be able to have both of those parts being looked at and not kind of be focusing only on one versus the other. So that, that's really helpful. Greg, I wanted to bring you into the, into this part of the conversation, just, you know, from your view, from, you know, kind of a little bit of an outside view uh, from outside of government, how you're seeing kind of this evolving role of these different C-suite positions and how they work together. Yeah, thanks, Ryan. As Chris mentioned, there are many different models out there. And so we've worked with both private and public sector organizations, North America and Europe. We've seen a lot of different versions. I'll go back to the case study uh, because it's illustrative from, from their strategy of how to use data. Their view was that the data owners were the program managers who needed it to make decisions. And the stewards were the, the, the large IT department that they had. Uh, what they needed to do was was put a translator, so to speak, in between the program managers and the IT group. So they created a set of uh, what they referred to as analysts that was led by uh, somebody, so a chief analyst or something like this. Uh, and the deal was the program managers would pull from the data stores and the analysts would help make sure they had the right data, it was of quality. Relationship with the other C-levels were just like that. The head of the analyst group was there along with the CFO and the CIO and those conversations about, it was never, so what they told me was the conversations were never about um, how to get data and, and all that. They trusted the IT department to deal with that. The conversations were about how we're going to use data to deliver better results. And they trusted that the IT group would do their work, but that analyst group in the middle that translated those request for data into good, clean quality data and the data science pieces. Uh, they depended on them more than ever. So it was a federated model, basically, pushing the responsibility out to program managers to manage their data, relying on the data analyst, the business analytics group that they put together. That's great. Thanks, Greg. Um, and Peter, I wanted to bring you in as well. You know, you for many years had been a chief information officer. So I'd be kind of curious to get your perspective from having sat in that role before as well. Yeah, just uh, two historical comments and then one observation from this study. One is, uh, you know, in, in going back to the 90s, I actually did a presentation to a committee of deputies that explicitly decided that when the internet was becoming a thing that uh, we needed to let a thousand flowers bloom. And uh, maybe we don't have a thousand flowers in the diversity of the CDO roles, but I do think there's real value in the diversity. Certainly there's going to, it will be necessary. And the... Uh, you know, just understanding context and adapting is going to be really important. Uh, we talked about the combining of roles. At one time, I actually ended up being the chief information officer and the interim chief financial officer for the Department of Justice. I tell you, a lot of people thought that was a conflict of interest. I found it that it was a just a credible commonality <laughs> in terms of uh, some of the things we could get done when I was doing that dual role. I'm not sure it's going to happen very often because I do think you need kind of separation <laughs> of uh, the CFO function, but it was uh, it was certainly interesting to have that experience. And I just want to pick up on uh, Elise and the dual reporting relationship. I've used that model a few uh, times, but we when we were out talking to internal stakeholders, a lot of them still think that if they need good data, good analytics, they go to the strategic policy branch. And I think that's one of the challenges that the chief data officers that are in the sort of digital IT uh, organization are going to have to reach out and make sure there's a really good alignment and, uh, and support and that that role is understood and how they're complementary and uh, can build on each other. No, that's great. Thank, thanks, Peter. Um, and thanks, everybody. I wanted to make sure we had a chance for everyone to get in on that question, just because it really was a very foundational one to the study and some of the issues we were looking like at in terms of that, that governance relationship of the chief data officer role. Um, we've got a number of other questions that have come in, and I'm, I'm conscious we've got about 20 minutes left. And so I want to make sure we can try to get to a number of these. Um, the question I want to go to next came in from Cesare. And, and the question was, um, TBS has established digital standards some time ago. How are these standards being implemented by CDOs? 
what challenges arise in their implementation and what are some of the strategies to overcome these challenges. Um, Teresa, I'm going to go to you first to, to get your thought on how Transport Canada has kind of been bringing the digital standards into the work that you're doing in the CDO office. Yeah, absolutely. So a part of it is about your sphere of control versus your sphere of influence. And the one challenge I, I sometimes face is um, as sort of the, the CDO, you're a bit on the outside, right? So our sphere of control, like we don't run the programs, we don't own the data, we don't own the services, right? That sits with our, with our uh, lines of business. So I'm a little bit on the outside, right? I can do a lot of cheerleading, um, but at the end of the day, uh, you know, we can put uh, my, my, my sphere of responsibility are all the platforms and all of the guidance. And we certainly do help with, you know, data visualizations and, and, you know, helping with the data literacy. But at the end of the day, if you look at, you know, an inspector who's, who's, um, I don't know, at the airport, uh, going through their daily work and, and doing the inspections, um, you know, I, I don't think they're, you know, they're starting their day off saying, who's my end user? And how can I be a good data steward today? Right? So, for us to be cheerleading to them and pushing, you know, um, data and the digital standards on them is not necessarily always going to be um, met with exactly the compliance or the excitement that we're hoping for. So what we're trying to do is turn things around a little bit, right? So um, really looking at it from a service. So look, if you think of it, you know, everything's a service, right? Either you're, you're providing internal services or you're providing external services. So looking at that service as a holistic piece, right, as a system. So who's your end user of this service? Who's your internal user? Who's your external user? And what are their needs? And then looking at what data if, across that process, what is the process? What is their user's journey? And then what are the processes behind the scenes, right? What data are we collecting from the user? What data is the user providing? And what other data exists around that service? That we can that we that can help us make decisions, right? We then look at the processes, and we look at how can um, maybe we can automate some of those processes. Use artificial intelligence, machine learning, robotic process automation. You know, within that within that system, and then we look at the service as a whole. You know, are we doing a good job with our service? Are we delivering? You know, on time? Are people waiting months and months for their grants and contributions, or are they, you know, getting some sort of feedback within 24 hours? You know, how are we delivering those services? So there's data about the data, and then there's the data that flows through the service. Um, so something like going back to, uh, you know, the air, the um, the inspector at the airport, get over to the airport, right? following the inspector, understanding their user, designing a solution with the user, see what data they're collecting and what data can we get in from the outside that can help them. So we have certain, you know, have there been certain airlines that have been caught leaving their back door open on their planes on the tarmac over and over again? That's data that we need to pull in so that the inspector can see that right away and doesn't have to rely on, you know, either memory or having to talk to other people, right? What data can we pull in from industry? So the data standards are there as a great guidance, um, and they're there to support good service delivery, both internal and external. But it's really up to us to sort of help our lines of business understand how to use that, how to use the digital standards and serve to live them, to embody them, and then come up with solutions that can help them at the end of the day. And I really like, you know, going back to Greg's initial pieces, really look at what is your business outcome? What do you want to achieve? And then you know, build that service and build that solution around um, around what it is, around that outcome. Oh, th thanks, Teresa. Chris, I know you wanted to jump in on this question around digital standards as well. So I'll go over to you next. Thanks so much. So uh, so I've got the digital standards uh, poster on my bedroom ceiling. So they're pretty much all kind of baked into the work that we're doing. But the ones I'll, I'll focus on are three. So one, agility, iteration, and empowered teams. So the work that we're doing is really... Uh, working with business lines and building effectively quasi-autonomous data service teams in the business that have got the data skills and the storytelling skills and the tools and the platforms that they need to do that work at the point of business. And stewardship comes along with that. And doing that, we use agility in a couple of ways. So one, we, we have a hypothesis that we're testing on how we think this will work and how we think this will roll out. I'm pretty sure some things are going to light on fire. So we're going to be learning as we're doing this and rolling that out. But also the process with these teams is actually walking them through like the agile beta production. So really working on the design thinking as well. So we're not just 
building dashboards, we're getting back to that. What are the outcomes you want to see and how do we use data effectively to get there? So thanks so much. Thank you, Chris. Um, I wanted to get to another question that had popped up in the chat because I think it's a really important one. Um, and this is a question that came in from Phil Grattan around culture change. And so Phil's question was, you know, culture change is a massive leadership challenge, awareness of technology that underpins data as an asset. one dimension, but leaders, managers, and especially executives should have a level of data literacy to match, you know, the expected levels for human resources and financial literacy. And, and Phil makes the point that, you know, it would be unacceptable for an executive to be financially illiterate. So it should be the same for data. And that's kind of key to, to making that culture change take place. I love the question because it gets to two of the big themes that came up in the study, right? One around culture change and one around capacity building and training. Um, and so, James, I want to go to you first to get your thought on, on Phil's question. And, and maybe a bit of how you're kind of approaching these issues uh, in your departmental context. Yeah, I just love this question. And like, it was only maybe 18 months ago was the first time I watched one of our analysts take a bunch of disparate data sets, drop them into a common location, run a bunch of queries with R, I think it was, and like dashboard that stuff live instantaneously in the kind of way that typically would have taken a policy analyst with an Excel spreadsheet like a week. Um, and so that kind of demonstration is incredibly powerful. And that's the kind of thing that I think we need to focus on because we have these areas of competence and expertise all over the place. But especially at the more senior levels, we haven't necessarily seen it. And so we don't know what we can demand. So you're sitting there trying to do your policy options for a memorandum to cabinet and you're coming at it from a traditional sort of policy storytelling kind of zone. You can have better data under there and you don't know yet. And you think you're getting terrific analysis and you're getting really good policy analysis and really hard work from policy analysts, but they don't necessarily have the competencies and capacity to deliver the kind of data analysis that's there. So partly this challenge for me is about showing what's possible because as soon as you see what's possible, you're like, I want that. Um, and then it's about building the, the capacity. Well, at the same time, it's about building the capacity across. So anyhow, wonderful question. Thank you very much. No, that's great. Thanks, James. Um, Aliza, I want to bring you in on this question as well. Absolutely. Merci, Philippe, pour la question. Vraiment, it's, 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 a, it's an everyday thing. And I think, James, we have the similar approach, right? Like we'll, we'll, we'll give you this nice dashboard. We'll show you quickly how we got to it. And, and then um, we're going to explain to you all the neat thing we need to do to be able to advance that. But I think the other angle I want to take on this one is that some folks are quite afraid when you talk about data and define the tech as a bit of a uh, of a blockage for them to get into. And and I think that what we're trying to do at AFC, both the, the top down and the bottom up approach to to data literacy is to also everyone is a data person, whether they like it or not, or whether they realize it or not, right? And I think there's been a lot of work done on in, um, information management, finance management, and all of these things. And I couldn't agree more with you, Philip. If this is, if data is an asset, we need to have the same kind of stewardship and the same kind of respect for it that we have for our other resources. And it goes through simple things. We we, we try to get at it on uh, from several prongs, right? We do speaker events, but we also work on demonstrating. We've, we've held workshops to help folks take, make the maximum that they can out of Excel because you know what? It still is the main software that's used to do data analysis. And then showing them uh, the benefits of automation, how it can in the little things that we can do and, and, and improve the quality of their life. And I think that senior management uh, and executive are interested with um, with data, they're wanting to learn more. And I think that we need to capitalize on that enthusiasm and continue to advance uh, the data literacy and have them feel confident also, right? Not afraid of, of what it means. So anyway, I, I'll leave it at that for now. I know there's a lot of questions and not that much time. So thank you for that great question. Well, thank, thanks, Elise. Appreciate uh, the perspective on that. And yeah, we've had a, we've had a lot of great uh, questions kind of coming in, and I want to make sure we get to a few more before our time comes up. I, I'm going to maybe go to a question, um, and, and we might actually I'm going to I'm going to go to Chris next to, to maybe kind of first kick off on on kind of uh, two questions that might be of interest to him. So one was a question from Darren Goodyear. 
Um, and Darren had a question around data governance. And, and, I, and I may ask, others want to jump in on this as well, because this came up as you saw in some of our study results. You know, the data governance really is one of those key functions for, for chief data officers. You know, all data business is data. Um, and so, you know, our, our CDOs, and be curious to get others' views on this as well, but I'll go to you first, Chris. You know, are you well placed in your organization to have the levers to make decisions to improve data quality? So let, I'll go to you first on this question, Chris, and see if there's some others who want to jump in on this as well. Thanks, Ryan, and thanks for the question. I, I think the answer in, in the public health agency is yes, as long as we're doing it with others. Um, so we have surveillance leads. We need to take our lead from them. Right? Like, what are the priorities for the agency? I shouldn't be figuring out, like, what are the public health priorities for the organization? So those need to come from somewhere. And the framing that we're putting on it is empowering governance. Like, we know every time we try and do something with data, the same things come up. Okay, what about privacy? What about security? What about intellectual property? What about IT? What about all of these things? What about, you know, the partnerships and MOUs? So how do we set up governance tables that actually empower the teams so that those go through faster and we're on a cycle speed of weeks, not months in setting them up. Teresa, can I go over to you next just for some thoughts on this data governance issue? Absolutely. So um, we're actually putting in place a new uh, service modernization governance um, and it's going to be agile and it's going to be adaptive. So it's a little bit of a different model than your, your, your sort of typical um, bureaucratic governance. Um, we wanted to keep it light and we want to be able to push down decision making to the lowest possible possible um, sort of uh, um, spot in within the within the system, like the people who are actually working in it. And what we really want to do is, is make sure that, you know, when we're talking about authoritative sources of data, making sure that we have representation from all the lines of business. And then we have agreement. So some things are really simple when it comes to data governance, because, you know, our rail people will have, you know, obviously they're responsible for rail data. But when it comes to things like stakeholder data, who owns that? Everyone has, you know, an Excel spreadsheet on their or their or, or a OneNote that has, you know, a list all of their uh, their key contacts and their key stakeholders. But, you know, someone gets swapped out, for example, the CIO of Air Canada gets swapped out who has that sort of master list. So those are the ones where it's a little bit, a little bit uglier, a little bit harder to figure out. So that's where we are leveraging our governance and our first service modernization and really saying, okay, we as a department agree that this is going to be our authoritative source. Um, and then we make sure that at the table, we have our privacy people and we have security and we have, um, you know, we, we have that understanding of what can be released, what can't be released, what can go through open data, um, we really want to push open data as much as possible. As far as I'm concerned, you know, open by default is the way to go. Um, and so I think that's putting that 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 structure in place and giving that that adaptive and flexible um, uh, ability without without having those hard rigid lines. I think will really help us uh, in the long term. Thanks, Teresa. Yeah, and in, interesting. You, you know, you mentioned open data. That was one of the things that actually kind of jumped out at me from the study was actually the fact that open data had been relatively low on the priority list yeah. amongst a lot of the respondents to to the survey we had done. And so that's great. You know, great to hear. You know, kind of the view that you're taking of, of that being a key priority and seeing how we can enable that. Um, and speaking of things that are open, uh, we we had an interesting question come in around open open standards and open source software uh, from from Salman. Uh, and I wanted to kind of bring this question, and, and Chris, I'm going to bring this one to you because I know in particular you've been a real champion of open source software and, and wanted to get your thoughts around this. But, you know, Salman's question was, you know, in line of TBS guidance around open standards and using open source software where possible, you know, how might we as public service servants leverage open source technologies and creating data platforms so that multiple government departments can benefit from each other's work? This was something, you know, in the study, this was actually one of the recommendations we had was around, you know, giving public servants who are working in data roles the tools they need, which obviously may include looking more at open source solutions. But yeah, Chris, because I know this is an area you've worked on, love to get your thoughts on this and how you've approached uh, this particular issue. Yeah, thanks, Ryan. And thanks, Salman. The So I think first, it's important to underline, like we wouldn't have data science uh, in the position it has in the world if it was not founded or, or on the foundation of open source. Right, like all of the work that's been happening, it's all open source. The companies that are doing the best work in the world today on machine learning and AI 
are using open source frameworks that have been supported and built by this community. So this is the foundation that we're all standing on and probably why we're even considering CDO roles as important in organizations and organizations across the world have the ability to start thinking, how do we use data at, at this level of, of, of efficacy? Uh, so I think it's extraordinarily important, especially for government to give back in this space. Uh, public funds, public code should be the baseline here. And there will be some things that we can't do in terms of, of privacy, in terms of national security. But for the most part, if we're talking about algorithms, like we should be able to put them out there and it will actually help public trust. This, if it's replicable and people can say, oh, this is the data or a sample of the data or a synthesized version of the data, right? That has all the properties, but doesn't actually relate to any personal information. And they can verify, oh, now I understand what government is doing. Because I think like we've been, uh, public health had uh, a lot of discussion on mobility data based off, honestly, some, some I'll just say, interesting reporting. Uh, but then there, there wasn't the level of data literacy or the level of communication to say, no, this is how it works and this is how we can do better. So I think it, it's, it's fundamental to us doing excellent work going forward. Yeah, uh, thanks, Chris. And and obviously, you know, that obvious link back to the digital standards we were talking about around working in the open, using open standards. Um, no, a, a great consideration on this. Um, we're we're running into our last kind of five minutes before we wrap things up. And so I want to just do a very quick lightning round, you know, with our panelists to get any kind of final thoughts from them or kind of big takeaways they want to leave with people um, as we close the session off today. So, um, Elise, I'm going to go to you first and then I'll rotate around the group. Thanks, Ryan. Thanks for everyone. As always, uh, it was a very enriching uh, discussion. I, I guess my uh, my my takeaway or my last word is going to be: uh, data is a team sport, so uh, don't don't forget about it. Uh, talk to colleagues, reach out. There's always enthusiastic people that are willing to take on the challenge. So thank you, everyone. Thanks, Elise. Uh, James, I'll go over to you next for some final thoughts. I think we could have talked all day. There's so many. We didn't really talk about AI strategies. We didn't really talk about like um targeting our our education programs and capacity building to different uh, cohorts of people but um the last thing i want to say aside from thank you to iog and thank you to forward 50 is um uh, there's terrific demand for people in with data skills all of us are hiring uh i'm not sure i can't see the list of who all's in this um forward 50 meeting uh, but um, if you're thinking that you'd like to be working in the government or with one of these agencies, just think about the topics that you care about passionately, whether that be rail and air safety or public health or mental health or like drug licensing and making sure that vaccines come online fast enough or food security and, and, and agricultural programs like reach out to us. We need you, especially at more junior levels, like especially at like analyst uh, levels we are really needing and you don't have to stay with us forever we know that the turnover is fast that the demand is high and our position in our offices are places where you get a lot of exposure so um like please reach out it's a great call to action james hopefully everybody's inboxes get flooded with cvs after this so that, that, that'd be a good outcome of today's session um teresa i'll go over to you next for uh, some final thoughts yeah, so thank you so much for having us. Like I and and thanks for this whole study. I it was a it was an amazing journey, and you know here we are. And uh, uh, I think you know I, I think for, for the work that you did, Peter and and Ryan, and with all my colleagues, um, you know, sincerely thank you so much because I think this is just the start of a conversation, right? Um, this isn't this isn't the end. This isn't the you know the chapter is done, and we just kind of go, okay, that was a fun report, and then we keep going on our on our journey. Um, but I think you know this is the beginning, and I I think the way I always like to look at it is like it's like a tide, right? We are enablers at the end of the day. So as the tide sort of rises, how do we make sure that all the boats are rising simultaneously? And you know we look to those who um, you know who are uh, doing it well, early adopters and the champions, and then we have to make sure that those who are sort of lagging behind are, are keeping up. And I think at the end of the day, uh, if we're all in this together and I, I loved, you know, Elise's, you know, it's a team sport. And so, yep, I think that's, uh, that's, that's the key here that we're all in it together. Thanks. Thanks, Teresa. Uh, Chris, uh, final thoughts from your end. Thanks so much. So th thanks, uh, huge thanks to Forward50, IOG and my colleagues, and also everyone who joined us here today. 
Um, if you're here and you're interested in data, I will just echo James's comments, like hit us up. Uh, you'll, you'll have some really interested folks to talk with. And even beyond that, like the, the skills and the interest that you have, if you're watching this, are going to serve you really well. So there is, there is tremendous value to public service uh, and working government, and, and we need the best minds that we can find uh, to come and work on these problems. So there, there's huge potential uh, and a lot of work to get there. And again, just the, the ethics and the bias, like the, it's a space that I'd love to see more people kind of putting putting real attention to. And I think will become even bigger uh, over the next, you know, coming years to decades. So thanks so much. Thank you, Chris. Greg, any final words from uh, from your perspective? Yeah, three quick things. Uh, one is uh, open data needs to be part of your data strategy for sure. Uh, governance needs to fit with the risk profile of the organization. Each organization has a different risk profile, so we have to be aware of that. Uh, program managers need to pull data, so we need to make them raving fans. And in terms of uh, skills, yeah, we're going to be graduating a whole bunch of folks who understand how to do this. So uh, I'll point them your way. That's great. Thanks, Greg. So, Peter, I think we're up at time, and I was just thinking, Peter, we could have probably had kept this conversation going for another uh, hour and a half or so at least. Um, Peter, any final any final thoughts uh, from your end before we kind of wrap and pass the floor back to Alistair? No, I think I think we need to wrap. I'll just say I think the process was as good as uh, as as the report, and uh, hopefully you'll enjoy the report. But I really enjoyed working with this community to uh, get this outcome. Thank you. No, thank, th yeah, thank you, Peter. It's been a, it's been a pleasure working with you on this, with everybody on this. As you said, the process has, I think, been part of the power. Would encourage people who are interested in this. Hopefully, this was a, a good teaser conversation. Um, you can read the report. I'll ask our friends at Forward Fifty maybe post the link again into the chat on LinkedIn Live, uh, and we'd love to hear from you. We'd love to once people have had a chance to to read the recommendations, read our findings. Please feel free to reach out to Peter or to myself. I think you've got an open invitation from the others on the panel to engage. And uh, we'll be looking forward to finding ways to kind of keep this conversation going in different ways over the coming weeks and months. So thanks so much, everybody. Thanks uh, to our hosts, Forward 50, for having us today. And uh, Alistair, I will turn the floor back to you to, to wrap things up. Thank you so much, Ryan. Uh, Peter, everybody, uh, Greg, and uh, those of you doing the hard work of making this stuff happen, uh, really appreciate your time. Uh, and I have to say, one of the things I've loved about Forward 50 is, as you all probably know, like it's eight people. We just kind of started this. Um, I was on a call last year. I got up at five in the morning and watched Audrey Tang in Taiwan, Christo Vahar in uh, Estonia, and Pia down in Australia, P. Andrews, uh, build a Miro board kind of framework for government as a platform across four time zones. And I think we have an amazing ability to um, make government more transparent and let people of any kind um, learn what's actually going on behind the scenes uh, with topics like data. They're so important and sensitive. I mean, it's not just code, it's code that is about people, right? Um, it's kind of like the soil and green of information. It's people. And we have to be very careful with that stuff. And uh, things like being able to stream to LinkedIn Live like this, where it's incredibly accessible and transparent and just talks about this stuff, I think is a very good first step. So I want to thank all of you, not just for collaborating on the report with the IOG. And by the way, that's already gone out in our newsletter. We have a newsletter that has a few thousand subscribers now. There's a link to that in there. Um, but it's also... Um, Amazing that you've all been willing to share so candidly because it is uh, this recognition that data is already important and is getting more so um, as we add new technology stacks like AI and just teaching people how to think critically about it and show them what's possible is incredibly important. So uh, thank you all for your willingness to sort of step up and be open and transparent because I think uh, this is one of the most important factors um, in this whole conversation. Et Elise, merci beaucoup d'avoir participé en, en, en plutôt en anglais, certainement. C'est un événement bilingue, euh, euh, vu que c'est canadien, mais vu que ce contenu s'en va partout dans le monde sur LinkedIn, euh, de temps en temps, on fait des choses seulement unilingues, mais euh, votre participation est très appréciée. Um, so thank you all very much. Uh, I'm sure you'll be able to go to the LinkedIn event and see comments there, and people can view it after the fact. So there may be comments that happen uh, beyond this conference. It's a new thing we're exploring with live streaming this stuff into LinkedIn. So uh, thank you all so much. A couple of housekeeping notes. Um, as I mentioned, 
Um, we put on content like this, uh, the forward 50 extras on a regular basis. Um, if we, um, if there's any way we can provide additional kinds of content, please reach out to us. Uh, we build this content and send it around the world, uh, because it's relevant and interesting to what people are doing with public sector modernization and digital government. And if there are topics or people you want to hear, uh, please let us know. Uh, we do stuff throughout the year like this, obviously leading up to our larger event in November, but um, we're continuing to do more and more of these sessions uh, virtually and, and in hybrid sort of studio modes in the coming months. So thank you all very much for attending and thanks again for all of our speakers today for joining us and being so open with their views. Have a great day.